Pro Cannabis Media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another very special edition of In the Weeds with Jimmy Young, a weekly podcast featured here on Pro Cannabis Media. Actually, it's an interview that we do on video, and then we strip the audio file and turn it into a podcast because basically I don't want to do twice as much work, to be perfectly honest with you. And I love getting guests like the next one I have because he's an attorney for Vicente Cedarberg, which is recognized as one of the top cannabis law firms in the country. They've written a bunch of state laws, uh, state questions, ballot questions. And Charlie Olivacetti is a author and an attorney, and he wrote the book on the cannabis business. Charlie Olivacetti, thank you so much for joining me on In the Weeds today. Thanks, thanks for having me. Tell me, why did you decide to write this book? And by the way, considering it's only uh, 187 pages long, it's a very readable uh, challenge to get through it all. So uh, again, good job on the book. But why did you want to write this book? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I thought um, cannabis being a pretty new area of law, I thought it'd be helpful to have sort of a, a good primer, um, kind of the high level issues that the questions we get all the time. I think, you know, I just thought it'd be more efficient, um, both for, you know, training our junior associates, uh, and also making it available for people that are sort of uh, you know, getting into the industry, you know, it's kind of a quick way to get up to speed on the laws. I, I thought it'd be helpful for people. Um, and then, you know, maybe for, you know, family, you know, relatives who ask me about cannabis, I could say, you know, like, hey, you know, read the book and I can answer any questions you have. But I mean, it'd be, it'd be good, good, like grounding. On... So when they ask you about cannabis and media, you say, well, that's chapter uh, 20, exactly. right? Or whatever it exactly. is. Exactly, right? exactly. Well, uh, terrific. And I, I love the fact that it says understanding law, finance and governance in America's newest industry. There are so many levels and regulations in this new industry. Whenever anybody asks me, and I'm sure this has happened to you, hey, Charlie, you got any good ideas on investment for me? What should I where should I put my money in the cannabis space? And I always tell them the same thing. Invest in a law firm because the law firm is going to be just fine on either side of the issue as they unfold, because first the laws have to be written, then they have to be challenged. And then you've got precedents. Am I accurate, Charlie? I mean, yeah, it's, I think I, I don't, you know, I suppose it's possible, but I think it'd probably be unlikely that we end up with a simple regulatory framework in, in the U S around cannabis, just, just based on the way it's unfolded. I mean, it's really only gotten more comp complex. Right. Things have gone along. And our law firm, schools starting to uh, offer either adjunct instructor uh, courses uh, on cannabis, as far as you know? Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of courses out there on cannabis law. Um, you know, it, we, we were working, we had, you know, it wasn't really an endowed chair, but our law firm had sort of a position uh, at, at DU, Denver University, briefly. Um, yeah. The professor's still there. I don't think they they got rid of the position on because it was an endowed chair. But yeah, there's 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 courses now throughout the country at different different uh, law schools on on cannabis law, um, and you know you know one or two at at a bunch of different schools. And and would you would you say that the law community has embraced cannabis more than the medical community, which still has some issues because it's a federal Schedule One substance? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the vat, you know, most law lawyers, most law firms have embraced the industry at this point. I think there's, you know, everyone works, you know, because with cannabis, there's international cannabis transactions that are not in violation of federal law. So that, that tends to be the only dividing line at this point is that some people won't publicly get involved with the US industry, but they have no problem working on say Canadian transactions or European transactions, because those are not, uh, in violation of federal law. But yeah, you, you know, these days it's like you throw a rock and you hit 15 cannabis lawyers. <laughs> you know, it's different. Like, I guess I, I got into the, 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 uh, the, the game five, six years ago. And back then I think people were a little bit um, more afraid of it. But nowadays, you know, people are sort of rushing in. And of course, I think the biggest question always seems to come down to the fact that it still remains a Schedule One. Uh, controlled Substance, according to Tricky Dick's Controlled Substances Act of 1973, which has now been, you know, really debunked at this point. And at some point, something's going to give. Um, the, the challenge 
in this particular case, I think, is the fact that you've got a plant that can be under the Department of Agriculture if it's qualified as hemp, less than 0.3% THC, or uh, cannabis as a drug, because that's the one that's been on the Schedule 1 um, do not do no medicinal value list uh, since 1973. And, and I think we all recognize that that was really driven more by uh, systematic racism than anything else, as I like to throw out there on a somewhat regular basis, because people are always looking for examples of it. And I say, just point to the plant and look at the laws and look at who made those laws. Just saying. That's yeah, a- I w- yeah, I would say as another part of that is like the, you know, uh, botanical medicine doesn't really fit into the regulation of the medical system in the U.S., which is really, you know, if you look, what, you know, for instance, there, there are THC-containing drugs that are fully federally legal, right? There, there's Marinol, which is synthetic THC, mm-hmm. um, which got approved in the early 80s, yeah. um, which cancer patients don't really like right. um, because, you know, they, you know, because it's purely synthetic THC, it doesn't have any of the terpenes in there. Um, people find it, they, they don't enjoy how disassociative it is. Um, but yeah, you know, that's an example of, all right, we're, we're all comfortable with this, you know, this psychoactive compound provided it's synthetic and it's not botanical. So uh, yeah, that, that's one of the big problems here. Is it, it, the system's not really designed for plant medicine. Right. P- provided that uh, the big farm is funding that whole thing. And it's the other one is Epidiolox yeah. uh, that, that's out there too. And, you know, again, uh, you make a great point. You, you know, you bring up a word that a lot of people still aren't really sure what it means. It's terpenes. And those are the, the steering mechanisms inside the DNA of this plant. You know, I didn't do chemistry in college or even in high school for that matter. Um, but now after I've talked to a bunch of PhDs and in botany and what have you uh, as an interview, I've learned quite a bit about what they can do with this living thing, that this plant. And, and the thing that concerns me the most as they develop how they're going to regulate it and, and how everybody can be in compliance is, it, is the people that are making those decisions, okay, and I'm talking, I'm going to point the finger right at our nation's capital, really don't have the education to do that. So the importance of the lobby is so important now in Washington, D.C. to educate those who are deciding what to do. Um, are you comfortable with the fact that our, the, our elected officials are still going to make decisions on this based on really just new information that they're just learning about in the last year or two? Well, I mean, I guess I would say that, you know, it'd be helpful if there was more research on, <laughs> can, you know, because I guess historically, right, if you look at getting, getting through um, institutional review boards, you know, you could really only do studies on cannabis if it was, you know, we're going to study how damaging it is. Right, uh, it's it's difficult to get these studies approved to see the medicinal benefits, and, and one of the challenges with getting that approval right is to make it replicable. Uh, it can be difficult um, with a botanic a botanical substance versus a synthetic, um, you know. But yeah, it'd be great if we had more research. Um, and so I certainly don't think there's any harm in additional research. Right, and actually, they're after ignoring the research world for many, many years, and it, amazingly, it didn't go away, uh, they're now starting to ease up on some of those restrictions and offering uh, state-grown cannabis research as opposed to only the crap that the University of Mississippi puts out there. Right, right. I mean, I would just add that, you know, of course, this is like obviously bigger than just the United States. You know, the research is going to happen. Uh, it just may not be in the U.S. Uh, right. Exactly right. And, and it look, Israel... Uh, Raphael Meshulam was the guy who started and founded the THC and CBD and named those chemicals in the 60s and, and figured out that it had something to do with this internal uh, system that all mammals have called the endocannabinoid system. So uh, needless to say, international research has been respected now. Um, it took 30 years or so, 40 yeah. years for it to happen. But, you know, at least now they're, he's getting the respect he deserves. Um, I, there wasn't a question in there that was strictly a statement. <laughs> you understand that's how I do. one of the biggest issues that we're seeing in some of these states like New York, New Jersey uh, and others is the right uh, to grow it at home, the right to grow medicine at home, because we both know it's expensive to buy cannabis, even legally with a medical card. Now, the 
good thing about having a medical card in some states like Massachusetts, it's not taxed at the same level as adult use uh, cannabis at the recreational level. So there is an advantage to having a medical card in some of these communities. That being said, if I was suffering from cancer and I needed to grow it in my backyard in order to actually give me the amount of cannabis in my system to have an impact, I'm not sure I could afford buying it at the dispensary, but growing it would put a lot of responsibility on me, but obviously I'd be willing to try and do it the right way. The right to grow at home uh, in some states is approved and in others it's not. What have you found that as that issue uh, evolves and the importance of it as you fight state to state? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you know I mostly deal with uh, uh, the commercial side of the industry and from the commercial side of the industry, it's, it's really a non-issue um, because I, I think that you know it's, it's like anything else, right? I mean, I, I could brew my own beer, I could sew my own clothes, I could you know, raise and slaughter my own cattle, but I don't because, you know, it's tough to do those things and hold down my job. So, you know, I, I think people should have the, absolutely should have the freedom to grow their own medicine, you know, if they choose to do so. But I don't think that ultimately it makes a huge difference, um, it, you know, in terms of market prices, because people just, uh, you know, they tend to do it for themselves or they're not doing it at scale. I think what really shifts the equilibrium is, is when you have more of a caretaker model uh, where people can grow at scale for others because th that'll impact the commercial industry far more than home grow. Home grow, I think, um, you know, while it could impact the industry, I think it's way down the list in terms of, you know, again, the concern, of course, from, from some people on the commercial side would be that, you know, it's going to make it hard to have a viable business if everyone grow their own. Right. But I don't think that's really an issue. I think things like taxation and overregulation really impact the businesses far, far more than that ever will. No, oh, no, no question. And, and yet you're still seeing the caregivers and the early licensees in a state like Maine uh, battle uh, who, yeah. who has the control. And, you know, it, that's a tough one, isn't it? Because uh, I think everybody recognizes the medicinal benefits of the plant and the role that the caretaker has played in the past in, in making it available to those who needed it. Right. But now when legalization comes in and you've got money dictating, uh, compliance issues and regulations, it can be uh, a little contentious, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I, you know, of course, it's, I think the caretaker model is also, you know, you're not necessarily seeing it play out in these new markets, like a New York or New Jersey. And I haven't read the Connecticut bill yet, but I imagine there's nothing about care. You know, you see, um, I don't know if I'm wrong about the Connecticut care, care, caretakers in Connecticut, but I don't think you see the caretaker model sort of in these new rollouts of states. It's it sort of, it, it tends to be a, you know, it tends to be a vestigial aspect of states where there was that period of time where states would have the kind of the legal but unregulated market. And, and that's kind of gone, gone away as people are kind of going straight into a, legal regulated medical market and then to the adult use market as well. So, you know, from a national scale, I don't think it, it, it's, it's not like a huge issue. Uh, it tends to be really regional. I, I, I totally understand that. And yet, you know, it's funny how the people that are advocates and are certainly welcoming the fact that we have a legal industry in 18 or 19 States, depending on how you view South Dakota right now, that being said, uh, you know, you still have a lot of, um, illegal grow going on. And it, it, I think it will always survive because there is a way to undercut the prices that the legal market has had to put out there because right. their margins are so much bigger because of all the regulations, the attorney's fees, the planting fees, all the testing that has to go on. Uh, it, it's not easy. The, the margins to make money in cannabis are not that big, right, Charlie? Yeah, I mean, you know, depending on where you are on the on the value chain, yeah, it can be difficult for 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 profit margins. Um, you know, I think that the big issue, right, is is also on the taxes. You know, if you that's what people in California will tell you is it is the taxes are so high that it makes it hard to compete with the uh, with the illicit market. Um, I think the other thing is you, know, you got to think about like the dis, you know the retail dispensary saturation. If you're in a market where there's not a ton of retail dispensaries, it's going to slow down the rollout of the legal regulated market. Um, uh, of course, if you know over time, as it becomes easier to get uh, access, you know through the legal market, um, 
you know, I, I think that that'll, that'll spread over time. I mean, again, I just go back to thinking about, you know, is, is there still, um, you know, can you still buy underground alcohol in the United States? You know, yeah, you, you can, but is it, is it really a, you know, how much of the market is it, right? I, I think it's just over, over time, people sort of, they like the convenience. And I think the other thing that, um, for me at least, is is a huge plus is if you know something's been tested right um you know you know what you're getting um right. i think part of that discussion also goes to sort of the the fact that no one really has won the brand battle yet in cannabis um but i think as you see people you know prefer certain brands you know it's gonna be worth it to go into the store because you want to get a certain brand of uh you know it's, it's like with cigarettes where people are brand loyal versus you know just just rolling their own cigarettes Right. No, I, I get that uh, uh, totally. And yet you still have a county in California, Humboldt County, that yeah. is known, known for the fact that they're producing upwards of 80 percent of the illicit market in the United States. And they protect that those counties, that Emerald Triangle, uh, like a like Israel protects themselves from the border. You know, for, everybody's against them, but they're in there and they're going to survive as long as they possibly can. Yeah, no, it's 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 obviously you know I'm curious to see what happens long term. Right. Um, I, how how long is that long term? I, I get that question a lot. Uh, we, like, we talked about it recently, and I, again, I don't see it on the horizon in a year or two. Um, I I am of in the camp of five to ten years is more likely for a federal legalization plan. But I do think that the uh, low-hanging fruit, as our friend at the NCIA, Michael Correa, explained to us, of the safe banking and the descheduling are laws or are reforms that can be uh, introduced and perhaps governed. However, I'm not very confident with the current environment in Washington, D.C. right now about getting them to agree on anything except that slavery ending in 1865 was a good thing. They actually agreed to that after 200 years. You know, and I'm trying to think, is that positive? But that was what happened last week, right? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. So, I mean, it's sort of like, well, I think what you, know, you can say with some level of certainty is you can look at the current breakdown in D.C. And I, I don't think right now they're going to pass legalization. So maybe we see what happens post midterms. I mean, I would say three to five years is my guess, but I'd be hopeful. Yeah, you could see something on like a say banking pass or maybe an expansion of, um, you know, that what, you know, I guess, it, um, the, you know, the, 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 whatever the, the current term is I'm blanking on. Um, the yeah, I guess we call the, well, I was gonna say the Joyce, the Joyce Amendment. Okay. Um, the expa expansion of the prohibition of DOJ spending, spending funds to go after state legal businesses to right. both adult use and medical as opposed to just medical. Um, I think it was called McClintock Polis the last time they tried to get on the adult use side. And then, you know, the idea of maybe th there could be a new memo at the DOJ, you know, the kind of things you can do without having to pass something through the Senate. Because I think that you're going to need to see, um, you know, something tacked onto a piece of legislation that's already moving through the Senate. So right. if nothing's moving to the Senate, it's going to be tough to. They can't even agree on the time of day. Yeah. Okay? That's the sad thing. And they're supposed to be representing the people. And I don't, the people are divided. Let's, I, I'm not naive enough to know. I understand that. But we have to do something about creating uh, the center again. And I, and I haven't seen a lot of movement towards that in all. They really dig their heels in, and that really bothers me. Let's get off politics, shall we? Yeah. Let's talk, let's talk about advertising and cannabis, shall yeah. we? Because I did find that in your book, and I found that interesting. And as someone who has built a, a little media company on the East Coast, who's trying to uh, connect the more mature markets in the West with the East through conversation and talk, um, sponsorship, though, and informational uh, messaging uh, is where we are trying to explain to the industry that you still have control over it. I believe that because the consumer is in charge now of their own use of media and gets to pick where they get it from, when they get it, and even how they get it, whether they watch it, listen to it, read it on a, on a uh, document or it, on, on, on their smartphone, the consumer is in charge now of what they want to 
learn about and they search for it. And that SEO is the magic button for all companies who are looking to do marketing in the cannabis space. But again, if I'm a dispensary, I can't buy radio time. I can't put a TV commercial on. I can um, share information with those who have opted into my database as a customer or someone who's interested in learning. But reaching the public with messaging that is pro-cannabis is a challenge in this industry, isn't it, Charlie? Yeah, no, it's, it's tough. I mean, you're cut off from a number of sources. I mean, I think there, there are two big buckets, right? There's sort of some company, you know, the, the private company, right, which is, you know, I talk a little bit about when you're talking about Facebook or Instagram or, you know, getting on one of these app stores, right? They're going to have their own policies, right, which you're going to have to deal with. And the second one is, you know, I guess the second one we'll call the legal buckets, right, which is their federal restrictions, Right. Um, which you don't necessarily always need to worry about because, frankly, you're already violating federal law. Um, and as long as you're staying in confines of general federal um, policy, uh, then, then you're going to be fine, right? And by that, I mean you're not trying to advertise, hey, we're going to ship this across state lines, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the other one is, yeah, the states will have their own specific laws. Um, and then you even get even more granular that you get into the, the local issue. And that's, you know, things like signage, you know, depending on where you are, that the towns are going to have specific requirements about, you know, what, what size your sign can be, what kind of sign you can have. Um, but the states will regulate stuff like, you know, for instance, the latest New York bill talks about they don't want you to have any um, highway signs. Right. So it's interesting to see how these state nuances shape the way people advertise, because you see in Massachusetts, you drive around here um, and there's a lot of highway signage yep. uh, advertising with cannabis companies because it's, it's one of the few avenues they have. In Colorado, um, it used to be, or it still is, you know, one of the few um, opportunities people had would they would sponsor the highways. Right. So you look at who sponsors highways, you know, cleaning up the side of the highways. It's a lot of cannabis companies in Colorado. It was one of the few options. And then it's a great, um, it was a great source of revenue for certain sort of daily newspapers because you see a lot of advertisements in the backs for, you know, for discounts, for sales, what have you. Um, you know, for Westward, for example, which is a, you know, a, uh, you know, sort of a free paper out in Colorado that you see in Denver a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a real, it has been a real boon to certain, uh, you know, radio stations and uh, periodicals that were open to the, to the advertising, but that, that's not going to be available in every state because some right. states will prohibit the advertising of discounts. Right, right, exactly. The call to action is the key part of any commercial message. OK, and that the the best example of that is what we call direct response advertising. Uh, the late Billy Mays was probably the legend. He's probably in the direct response uh, advertising Hall of Fame somewhere in the sky up there. But uh, the point is, it's they sweeten the deal and there's always a call to action and the call. Now, that's what the regulators don't want. I get that. However, what they're missing out on is sharing information about the plant so that when people come into a medical dispensary or even an adult use dispensary they actually understand that there is a strain or a mixture of strains that can help with a, a specific ailment that they're looking for information so they go to the 25 year old bed tender behind the counter and expect that person to uh, to be the medical where all and end all um, I, I find very it's very frustrating to me that you can't even do a public service announcement about the benefits of this plant and to me that is restricting a whole new industry from sharing what they've learned with the public and it, it really bought, it's one of the things I rail about it all the time in my show, Charlie. So the people <laughs> who might be listening to this, oh, there goes Jimmy again. He's going off on the public service announcements. But I think it's really important, especially when you look at the data that says the fastest growing demographic group is the 50 plus group, 50 year olds and above. The baby boomers are looking for information on how they can improve their wellness through this plant. And they can't get any other information unless you walk in the door and talk to somebody or go online and start searching for it. So I don't know it's a frustration of mine. Do you think we'll ever see the day? And I'm intrigued, actually, you telling me something in Colorado, radio stations are um, getting advertisement from CBD companies or from THC. I think it's yeah. So it should be. I believe it's THC. Um, so you'll see, you know, so the, the rule in Colorado is you have to have some sort of data 
that it, I believe it's at least 70% of your audience is 21 plus. Which it's absolutely one. Of, again, this is the thing. First of all, the kids that are, when you're a teenager, Charlie, and I don't know how old you are, okay? I'm not but a when, teenager. <laughs> I know you're not a teenager, but when you were, what? Yeah, yeah. Me, it was a lot quicker to your age than it was to my age, okay? <laughs> At my age, when I was a teenager in the 70s and an adult told me not to do something, I did it, or at least yeah. I tried to sneak it, okay? That's just what we did back then. We were rebels, right? Now, I think it's all education-based, and I think parents have a great opportunity now to have these discussions with their children at a younger age. This is a great opportunity to talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll with your 12-year-old, you know, because it's not just alcohol is okay, but it could kill you. Weed is evil because it's illegal. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I guess, um, whew, a lot, lots There's a lot there, there, isn't there, Charlie? A lot there. I was going to say, like talking to kids. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, I think, I think, one hundred percent, the approach to, to drug drug education in this country has, you know, I, I, you know, honestly, I, I have no idea what they're telling kids right now. I, I remember, I vaguely remember what they told me. Um, you know, my, my kid's pretty young right now, so he's not, he's not getting any drug education in schools right now. So I don't, I don't know what they're saying, but I mean, obviously, you know, you, you want to, I think the problem is historically it's, you know, if you try and sort of demonize substances to children, you know, and then they, they use it and they realize, oh, well, like maybe they weren't telling me the truth and they kind of throw everything you said out when the truth is, you know, it's like, listen, we've done a lot of research on cannabis. It, it can be dangerous for some people. Um, you know, if you have a predilection to schizophrenia, um, right. mm -hmm. you should be careful with cannabis use. You should be very careful with psychedelic use, right? Right. Uh, it can be dangerous if you're young. Um, it's possible to, to, to abuse it. Like it is possible to abuse every drug, but do, does that mean that, you know, it's like you look at this old stuff they put out there and, you know, obviously it's insane. You know, it's not going to put you in a murderous rage. Right. Um, but, but yeah, you know, alcohol can kill you. And it oh, continues yeah. to kill a lot of people, including the binge drinking that goes on amongst teenagers these days. And that freaks me out. Luckily, I only have one child. He's 30 years old. But I care about a lot of young people that I've worked with over the years. And I do worry when they go off to college because I recognize it's an over 21-year-old activity to drink yeah. alcohol and legal. But wink, wink, we all know that it goes on at colleges. And these are 18, 19 and 20 year old kids who should have been educated by the time they got there, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, binge drinking uh, is, is, is a big Dangerous. problem. And yeah, right. it's, it's not, it's not, you listen, people have done some very dumb things when they're too drunk that and, they'd ever do sober. Right, and, and males in college tend to do more than their share, let's just say, okay? Yeah. And, just the, it's the nature of the beast here. Um, um, a question more about um, marketing now with, with the cannabis. There's actually, I believe the Cannabis Marketing Association is based in Colorado. And I've, I've had talks with them about this issue that I keep railing about the public service announcement. How, are, how is the industry going to um, educate the public when even as, I believe it was four years ago, that there was a commercial that Acreage Holdings put out that was basically a PSA. It was the stories of three um, people who were ill, dying, and were, they saved their lives through cannabis. And of course, CBS did not allow them to air it on the Super Bowl, but it aired in, in some territories um, around the United States of America. When, how quickly can we move to at least accept education and history of this plant in the public eye. This, this is where I don't, I don't see a balance. The media I saw on the national news um, this week, a study that came out, a 25 year study about marijuana and suicide. And they immediately made that connection that people who use marijuana are, think about suicide. And that was, a, that was the conclusion of the report. Well, a lot of people do. It's not just, they drank coffee too, and they drank alcohol too, but they single out that. They're, for, for 80 years, they've been looking for the reasons to not accept this plant. That's why you see all those studies by the substance abuse community funding all the research. Are we ever gonna see a change to this? 
Well, I mean, I, I think if you look and you know, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but if you look at sort of national polling about who's in favor of legalization, I mean, it's it's changed so much over the past, you know, 10, 20 years, right? Yep. And I, you know, it's like, I guess one of the, I'm not too worried about that. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm uh, too optimistic on this, but, uh, you know, if you just, it's a generational thing, right? The, the younger generation is so in favor of legalization. I just don't see any way that this doesn't sort of advance. It's, in my mind, it's like sort of the, 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 the war for, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, you know, like moral superiority or, you know, the, sort of the, the debate about cannabis in my mind is over um, and cannabis won. It's yep. really more of a question of how is it actually getting implemented? And then the problem is that like, there's this, you know, we talked about earlier with the Senate, there's just a disconnect between what average Americans want and what, what actually occurs, you know, in DC. Cause it, it, it seems pretty much like a bipartisan issue to me at this point. Right. Term limits would be helpful. Uh, personally, that's how I look at the political. We need to do a better job of turning over our representatives because I think they've lost touch with what the people really want. I really do. Even though I'm hearing, you know, one side of the fence a lot in Massachusetts, we hear one side of the fence a lot about the acceptance of it. But it's the other side of the fence that has to look at those facts, the science and the research now that debunks just about every myth and stereotype that's out there. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a big part of it is too. It's just if you look, at, you know, it's 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 there's a generational issue. You know, what's what's the average age in the Senate? Um, and then you know, it's, older it's, than me. Okay, that's old. <laughs> and then it's just you know, in terms of and less less so now, but um, with the Democrats being in charge, but um, you know, it can be it, it it can take it just takes a few handful of people at the Senate level to really grind stuff to a halt given the difficulty of passing legislation to the Senate. Should we name some of them? Because I can name a quite that handful <laughs> right now, okay? I'd be you know, right off the top of my head, but uh, let's not go there. Hey, uh, Charlie, The Cannabis Business is the book. How do people find your book and how, how can they learn about some of these things so they can talk as eloquently as you did about it? Well, so I would say this, you know, if, if, if you work in cannabis, if someone you love works in cannabis, if you're thinking about investing in cannabis and, you know, you, you want to get into the nitty gritty of, you know, what's an excise tax? Can I go to jail for investing in a cannabis company? You know, where can I cite my cannabis company? You know, these are the kind of questions we get all the time. This will give you the basics. Uh, just, you can just go cannabis business into, you know, it's Amazon, it's available for Rutledge, who's the publisher. Um, you can also go on Bookshop, a bunch of independent bookstores sell it now too. If you want to support a small bookstore, um, you can just Google my name as well. It's, it'll come up, A-L-O-V-I-S-E-T-T-I. And it was published this year. Did you have any problem finding a publisher for this? No, I had a, a couple couple offers actually to publish it. Um, but I learned something about, I learned a lot about the publishing industry this year. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, it's tough, tough business. Um, it is a tough, I have a friend who self-published six, six books and uh, he's a local uh, TV sportscaster in Boston. He's a great, he's a great writer. Um, and and you, you too have lived up to that uh, very, <laughs> Uh, easy to understand. You simplify the process. That to me is the most important um, so that anybody can pick this up and learn uh, quite a bit about uh, uh, banking and the challenges to that. And uh, I, I do recommend it. And I, and I do uh, really appreciate you taking the time from your Vicente Cedarberg life out there in Colorado to, uh, to join us today. Thanks. Thanks. And I appreciate you having me on. No problem at all. And, and um, we know now we can go to you uh, as, as a resource on a few things. And I'll, I'll be following up after this show. I appreciate that, too. OK, great. That's Charlie Olivacetti. He's an attorney and the writer of The Cannabis Business. He wrote it along with his cohort, Cassia Furman. You can find it on Amazon. And you can learn about this amazing plant that is shaking up the world right now. And that's why we always leave our recordings and our shows with the same kind of saying, remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Cannabis Media. We'll catch you next time.
Weed Talk and In the Weeds are two productions of pro-cannabis media supported by Revolutionary Clinics, one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the Massachusetts area, now with three locations in Greater Boston, two in Cambridge, and one on Broadway in Somerville. Rev Clinics has a patient-first mission. They will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains, flavors, and products. Rev Clinics, where the patient comes first. Hi, I'm Ben Shower, New England rep for Salient Video Management Systems. Let me tell you what makes us different in the security space. We're your trusted advisors for all your security needs. I know how complicated the regulations are in cannabis, and working with Salient Systems will be the polar opposite of that. I give free consultations and will walk you through every step of the process so that you can get what you need at the price you can afford. We're robust, we're simple and scalable. We're Salient Systems, your solutions to all your security needs. Please contact me at the information below and I'm looking forward to being your trusted advisor. Cannabis Media Programming is available live and on demand on our Facebook page at Pro Cannabis Media, on Instagram at Pro Cannabis Media, on LinkedIn also at Pro Cannabis Media, on YouTube and YouTube Live on Pro Cannabis Media, Twitter at Pro Cannabis Media, and on twitch.tv backslash Pro Cannabis Media. So like, share, and subscribe to all of our content, newsletters, and shows live or on demand. We are Pro Cannabis Media.